stirs the spirit and it calls the heart to life. It's an anthem in the making. Can you feel it start to rise? Can you hear the generations getting louder over time? Every son and every daughter singing out into the night. It's not time to be silent. Don't you dare hide your light. There's a world outside your window, so don't let it pass you by. Lift your hands to the heavens. Lift your voice to the sky. Praise the Lord of all creation. Let His name be lifted high. We're singing. As you draw close to your Lord Jesus, your good shepherd, you are safe. In the intimacy of his presence, you are energized. No matter where you are in the world, you belong when you experience 
his nearness. Ever since the fall in the garden, each of us has experienced a gaping emptiness that only God's presence can fill. Our Creator God designed us to experience close communion with Him. He enjoyed walking with Adam and Eve before the evil one deceived them. We can experience communion with God today because Jesus died on the cross so that our sins can be forgiven and we can be redeemed as children of God created in his image. When you commune with God in the garden of your heart, both you and God are blessed. This is God's way of living in the, in the world through you. Together, you and God will push back the darkness for Jesus is the light of the world. In John chapter 8, verse 12, Jesus spoke to the people saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. Please pray with me. Lord God, we thank you that because of Jesus' death and resurrection from the dead, we can draw near to you. We pray that at this communion time, because of Jesus' sacrifice, we will draw near to you. Lord God, thank you for offering us light instead of darkness. As we partake of the cup and the bread this morning, we proclaim you as Lord and Savior, and we choose to walk in your light and be a light to this world. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also pass on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. I don't want to be on my phone, but I can't be alone. Welcome to the modern age, trying to be somebody I'm not, but it's not what I want. Tell me there's another way All of the lights are chased are now faded All the cheap thrills are only time wasted Tell me why society's plan should define who I am Surely there's a higher way All of my best friends are sick of pretending We want the truth So much is missing so give us the real thing I know it's you Na 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 
I don't want a stereotype to decide who I am They never knew me anyway I'm over trying to find the next time Cause the high never lasts I'ma go another way All of the lights I chased have now faded Dylan was right, the times they are a changing Tell me why society's plan should define who I am Surely there's a higher way All of my best friends are sick of pretending We want the truth So much is missing Welcome to Church Online. It's so great to have you watching with us today. My name is Andy Beatty. I'm the teaching minister here at Central Christian Church in Mount Vernon. Uh, and we're in the third week of our series called Cringy. And what we've been doing is we've been looking at like the difficult, hard to hear, the, the teachings of Jesus that kind of cause us to cringe. Um, and, and, and so today we're going to look at something that's pretty serious in nature, uh, maybe even quite heavy because of the, the consequences associated with it. And so what I want you to do, though, is I want you to imagine kind of the world before COVID, all right? So let's say it's like late February, you're sitting in our worship area here, you know, 300 some people, and I want you to imagine uh, who would usually sit to your left, who would usually sit to your right, who would sit in front of you? Who would sit behind you? Because the reality is, like, there's no assigned seats in church, but everybody sits in the same spot every week. You know what I mean? Um, and, and so imagine who was sitting around you, and imagine that I wanted you to point to the person who looked like the biggest sinner. And I was like, one, two, three, go! Point at him. Imagine how awkward, how cringy, how uncomfortable that would be if we did that, right? And people started pointing at other people. That they th and then, you know, someone saw them pointing at them. And they're like, what? Not me. I wasn't even pointing at you, right? It, it would be awkward and uncomfortable, to say the least. And maybe even result in some, like, Jerry Springer-like scenarios here. Uh, the, the reality is we're all sinners, right? Uh, if, if we're honest with ourselves, we, we have to acknowledge that we're all sinners, uh, and, and that we've all fallen short of that standard that God has set. And, and we know that Christ came to forgive us of those sins. But, but here's where things get a little awkward. Here's where, uh, in my mind, things get a little cringy this week. In the Bible, it says there is something called the unpardonable sin or the unforgivable sin. I remember uh, as, a, as a junior high student hearing this. Uh, we, we were at a... Um, uh, like a Vespers session, and, and the guy was talking about sin and its consequences, and he just kind of mentioned, like just kind of like threw it out there, you know, the, oh yeah, well, you know, blah, 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 and then there, there's blasphemy, there's the unforgivable sin, you can never be forgiven of that, and then like he just kept moving on, like it was just like, oh, you know, no, no biggie, like this is a thing, and, and I remember just like hearing in my head, the unforgivable sin, unforgivable and this you know this booming voice I'm pretty sure it went dark outside and there was lightning and I was terrified terrified because I was like well what is the unforgivable sin have I ever done the unforgivable what is blasphemy I don't know have I ever done that um, and, and, and so I asked one of my camp leaders what it was and I got a cute little like oh you don't have to worry about that you're fine you don't need to worry about that you love God. And I was like, yeah, but I don't want to, 
I'm an idiot, right? Like I say a lot, I talk a lot. My teachers always said I had great communication skills because I love talking in class and, and so I don't want to like say the wrong thing and, and end up saying blasphemy, right? I wanted to make sure I didn't say the wrong thing and so I laid in my, uh, in my bunk bed there at camp that night just thinking and wondering and, and just like overcome with anxiety of well, what if I say the wrong thing? What if, what if I speak against the Holy Spirit? What if I commit the unforgivable sin? And it's crazy to think about how much God loves us, right? If, if, hopefully, when you have time to worship, read your Bible, uh, or just on a regular day kind of think, man, God loved me so much he sent his son to take my place, to endure like shame and humiliation and suffering and also that my sins could be forgiven. All throughout the Bible, it seems that no one is out of reach of God's usefulness. No one is too far gone for God's love. And yet, there's this teaching, kind of this amendment, that appears to be an exception. And so as Christians, how do we wrestle with this? Well, first, I want to read with you the text that I'm referencing here. So go ahead and open up your phone or your Bible to Matthew chapter 12. We'll look at verses 30 through 32. All right, so as you're looking that up, Matthew 12, 30 through 32, I want to give you some context here. Jesus has just healed a blind and mute man. Same man, blind and mute. All right, had been brought to him. He healed him. And all these people were astonished. And it should have been a joyous occasion. Kind of like uh, my wife and I love watching those military homecoming reunions. Uh, I, I love watching those for people I don't even know, right? And, you, you know, it's like the kid's doing so, like, something at school. And he, like, turns around and his mom or dad, who's a service member, who's been gone for a couple years, is right there. And you see that, that reunion and, you know, it's like you're overcome with emotions. That's kind of what should have been the case here. Right? This man had been blind and mute, and he's now finally able to see his family, to see his kids, to see his wife, to tell them he loves them again. This should be a joyous occasion for everyone to see. Not even the people that are directly involved, but anyone who's seeing this should be overcome with joy watching this. But not everyone shared that sentiment. The Pharisees, the religious leaders, when they heard about this happening, they accused Jesus by saying that he was doing all of this, not in the name of Jesus. No, and they didn't refute that he was doing it. They acknowledged his miracles, and they said, you're doing all of this, though, in the name of the devil. He rebukes them. Jesus rebukes them. He corrects them. And he's like, you think I'm doing all this in the name of the devil? Then why am I driving out demons, right? Why am I driving out the devils, uh, the, devil, the people that work with the devil and for the devil? And he says, a house or kingdom that's divided against itself cannot stand. And so that's kind of where we pick up Matthew chapter 12, verse 30. <clears throat> he says in verse 30, anyone who isn't with me opposes me. And anyone who isn't working with me is actually working against me. We could stop right there and that verse alone would preach. It's like, are you working with him? Well, if you're not working with him, if you're not serving with him, if you're not trying to grow his kingdom, then you're actually working against him. See, apathy is not an option to be a Christian. You can't just be in the middle. But anyways, that's not the point of our message this morning. Verse 31, he says, Jesus says this. He says, so I tell you, every sin and blasphemy can be forgiven. That's great news, right? That's so exciting. And then it says, except blasphemy against the Holy Spirit, which will never be forgiven. He says, anyone who speaks against the Son of Man can be forgiven, but anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. Okay. Whoa. He says, anyone who speaks against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven, either in this world or in the world to come. That's pretty intense. That's pretty cringy. That's pretty difficult to hear. And so if you're like me, you hear that, you read that, you see that, and you wonder, well, what is blasphemy? How do we know if we're guilty of it? Blasphemy is a very tricky subject, right? It's, it's not something there's a ton of material on. It's not something there's a ton of teaching in the Bible on. There's a, a few references here and there. Um, and, and so I want to start, as we try to work to define what blasphemy is, 
let's define what blasphemy is not first. Let's rule some things out. Because many times we turn on the news, we pull up a website, or, or we hear something on the radio about these horrible atrocities. Things like pedophilia running rampant on, on Netflix and Hollywood and, and all over the world. I mean, it seems like there's uh, trafficking rings being busted weekly at this point. Maybe you hear of some f cruel form of torture. Maybe there's some form of terrorism. Uh, as just a couple days ago, we remember uh, all the lives we lost on September 11, 2001. Maybe you hear of that type of terrorism. Maybe there's uh, extreme corruption from elected officials. Maybe there's just some sort of heinous crime. And what we're prone to do is we're prone to give in to our human nature, our lust for justice and vengeance, and say that those atrocities are unforgivable. Unforgivable. Yet the scriptures tell us that if the people that committed those atrocities confess their sins, then he can cleanse them of all their unrighteousness. The blood of Christ can cleanse man from all sin. So what's the unforgivable sin? Well, the unforgivable sin is not adultery, because we read in the Bible David was guilty of adultery, and yet the prophet said, your sins are forgiven. Jesus said to the woman who was caught in the act of adultery, and the crowd wanted to stone her, remember that? And he says, neither do I condemn you. Now leave your life of sin. The unforgivable sin is not murder. David was a murderer driven from his lust. Paul's hands were literally running, bled, blood, uh, running red with blood from killing and persecuting Christians. He voted in favor of Stephen's death and helped accomplish it. Moses was guilty of murder and was still used mightily. So it's not that. Is it denying Jesus? Well, Peter did that and he was restored. Is it suicide? Is that the unforgivable sin? Well, some assume that Samson could have committed the unforgivable act, but in Hebrews 11, it seems to indicate that suicide is not the unforgivable sin. So what is it? What is it? And how do we know if we've done it? It's a tricky subject. It really is. Uh, this is one of the harder messages I've ever prepared for. And so what I want to do is I, I want to start way back at the beginning with this. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. We see, we're going to see a little bit of like almost foreshadowing for this. Right? Genesis 6, 3. Then the, it says, Then the Lord said, My spirit will not contend with humans forever. My spirit will not contend with humans forever. One of the most amazing things in our faith is that we have the Spirit of God striving with us, contending with us, living with us. The Spirit of God speaks to us. The Spirit of God moves us. The Spirit of God changes us. His Spirit speaks to us of our sin. It speaks, us, it speaks to us of a call to be holy. It reminds us of that coming judgment. But this cringy idea that a time will come where the Spirit of God will no longer strive for us. We no longer seek to draw us to love God more, to no longer be convicted of sin. When I hear the way it's described in the Bible, my spirit will not contend with humans forever. Maybe your translation says my spirit will not strive with humans forever. When I think of contending and striving with people, uh, like contending, I almost think of like a boxing match, right? Like, like, okay, like there's our human nature and the Holy Spirit's just going toe to toe toe-to-toe -to -toe, constantly contending with us right it's a heavyweight fight the holy spirit's contending with us but we're told the spirit will not contend with humans forever or about striving uh, i think about some of the races i've ran and i'm striving i'm pressing on towards that goal right but in our our human our fleshly nature a lot of times we're striving and the spirit is there striving with us trying to say hey stop running towards death stop running towards sin stop running towards the edge of that cliff spiritually and at some point the spirit's going to stop striving with us if we continue to ignore that if we continue to give in to those fleshly desires i just want to pause right here and acknowledge that if god's spirit is still striving in your heart you should be worshiping him mightily every opportunity you get because there may be a time where he will no longer contend with you where he'll no longer strive with you. 
That's cringy. That's scary. That's nauseating to think about. So let's work at defining what it is. We kind of know what it's not. We kind of know what the consequences are. Now let's work to define what it is. Because we know that there could be a time when God's Spirit will no longer contend with us, will no longer strive with us. And we know it leads to dangerous consequences. So let's look at John chapter 12, verses 37 through 43. And I think this will help us understand a little bit better what this is. John 12, 37, it says, Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe him. Okay, I think it's important that we emphasize they would not believe him. Okay, verse 38, this was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, Lord who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed. Okay, verse 39, for this reason they could not believe. Because as, I, as, as Isaiah says elsewhere, verse 39 guys, read it again. For this reason they could not believe. I want you to notice the transition. Went from they would not believe, continued to be revealed, all of a sudden could not believe. Would not to could not. He has blinded their eyes and hardened their hearts so they can neither see with their eyes nor understand with their hearts nor turn and I would heal them. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. Verse 42 says, Yet at the same time, many even among the leaders believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith for fear they would be put out of the synagogue. Verse 43, cringy. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. I think that progression is important. They would not believe. He continues to reveal himself. Jesus does this over and over with the Pharisees, continues to reveal himself. And the progression is they went from would not believe to could not believe. What changed? Do you think God hardened their hearts against Jesus, revealing himself? Like it says in Exodus that God hardened the heart of Pharaoh? Is God hardening the hearts of these religious leaders so that they can't believe and so that they'll go to hell forever? Is that the type of God that you think we worship every week? Or was it a progression? They would not believe. Christ continued to reveal himself so they could not believe. And at some point, God's Spirit stopped contending with them. God's Spirit stopped striving. Here's how it progressed. The first time they met Jesus, they saw the miracles that he did, and he was saying, I'm doing these in the name of God. I'm one with God. And he's revealing himself as the promised Messiah. They, the religious leaders, they were faced with the issue of whether or not to believe that he was the promised Messiah. After some questioning, some argument, some speculation, they decided he was not. They would not believe it. Each time they saw another miracle, they heard another teaching, they saw the after effects of these miracles, the question would rise up, could he possibly be the Messiah? Is he the real thing? And each time they would definitively answer no. They had said no so many times to Christ that they now couldn't say yes. Therefore, they could not believe. So God was done revealing himself to them. The Spirit was no longer striving for them. The Spirit was no longer contending with them. That's a scary place to be when it gets a little quiet, when the Holy Spirit stops striving for you. I coach football, I'm filming this on the day that I'll go play Centerburg. Um, and, 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 you know, one thing we tell our kids because we'll get on them, we'll hold them accountable, we're going to work them hard, we're going to challenge them to reach new levels every single day. And so we tell them, hey, when we're yelling at you, when we're on you, when we're riding you, don't be upset. We're doing it because we care about you, because we love you, we want the best for you. Here's when you need to be worried. If you're a player on our football team, or really any team, it's when we stop coaching you. It's when we stop yelling at you. It's when we stop correcting you. It's when we stop trying to teach you. When we stop contending with you. When we stop striving with you. Because we've realized at that point, you're not going to change what you're doing. 
We have tried and tried and tried. And at a certain point, you get tired of repeating yourself. You get tired of doing the same thing over and over and over. And all of a sudden, you'll notice when that kid goes, it gets eerily quiet from all the coaches. When they do their rep, it's really quiet because they've stopped striving with him. The same thing happens here. Christ is revealing himself and revealing himself and revealing himself. And people are saying, no, I can't believe. I can't believe. I can't believe. Pretty soon, he stops revealing himself. Now, when this man in our text, the blind and mute man, uh, was brought to Jesus, you know, he was possessed with a demon. He was blind and mute, and Jesus healed him so that he could see and so that he could speak. Here's this indisputable evidence that he was the Messiah. The people were amazed and began to say, is this not the son of David? Uh, you know, and, and that's one of the titles of the Messiah. The Pharisees were forced to acknowledge the evidence. They were forced to acknowledge what had happened. There were so many eyewitness accounts, they couldn't deny it. However, they could not believe either. So what they did is they attributed this miracle that they acknowledged happened, this thing that is good that happened, they acknowledged it to a source other than God because they could not believe. And so they attributed what the work that Jesus was doing to the devil. The actual attributing of the works of the Holy Spirit to the devil was the evidence that they had approached or already arrived at a place of no return. The place where the Spirit would no longer strive with him. The place where God would say, like he does in Jeremiah 7, 16, let them alone. Pray no more for them. I have given them up. So what is blasphemy? Well, there's no easy, cute little preacher acronym type thing or some catchy little saying that preachers like to use a lot. But here's what it is. Here's what it would look like in our lives. It's the continual rejection of the Spirit in your life. It's a continual rejection of the fact that Jesus died for your sins. That is just the starting path of the unforgivable sin. It's the continued rejection of Jesus Christ as your Savior over and over and over. It's knowing, like the Pharisees, knowing a lot of stuff. Lots of head knowledge. But not, not a lot of soul obedience. Not a lot of practical application. That's how we work towards blasphemy. Is, is acknowledging, hey, at one point I was saved. God did something big. It was huge. But now I'm just taking all of that and I'm pressing it down way down you're going to get to a point where God's spirit will no longer contend with you if you die rejecting Christ rejecting his spirit there is no forgiveness in this world or in the next that's cringy that's hard to say it's devastating but it's all true that's what the inf unforgivable sin is Light has come to the world, revealed itself, made itself known, but people still refuse to go to the light. Their reason, like the Pharisees, they love the approval of man more than God. Or maybe we could, maybe we could look at that just a little bit different way, because they say, well, I don't care what people think, I'm going to do what I want. It looks very similar today. People may say, well, I don't, people may not say, well, I care about what that person thinks more, but they may say with their actions, well, I love comfort more than I love my God. I love my sin more than I love God. I love my time more than I love God. I love my family more than I love God. Ken talked about that last week. I, I, I love my money. I love my debt more than I love God. And the commentary I used pretty heavy for this message written by Chuck Smith. Um, he wrote this. And typically commentaries, if you've not read them, they're, they're very educational uh, in nature. Uh, very academic. They're typically not very preachy, at least the ones that I use. Uh, they're usually certainly not this direct, but this quote stuck out to me. Chuck Smith wrote this. He said, don't give me that junk about intellectual difficulties concerning accepting Jesus. Your problem is your love of evil. You love darkness rather than light. <laughs> That's pretty heavy stuff. Jesus was sent to the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. The continual rejection of that fact is the unforgivable sin. 
as I mentioned um, last week, I think in first service, it was, it's just a little over two years ago that I was officially diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. Um, and, and, and I remember one of the first things he told me, uh, kind of after I had you know, healed up a little bit, got out of the hospital, is he told me, you got to keep moving. You got to stay active. You got to use your legs, even when it hurts, even when it's difficult, even if your balance is really off, you have got to use them. Because he said most disability with MS is a learned disability. Uh, so what happens is it hurts really bad or it's, you know, you get a lot of muscle spasticity, really like bad muscle tightness in different areas. Mine really affects my legs pretty hard. Um, and, and so he said a lot of what happens is it's a learned disability, is it's so hard to use your legs so you'll stop using them. And then once you stop using them, you lose them. And so that's why I do stupid stuff like go down the water slides with the kids at church. That's why I'll play football with my kids. That's why I'll try to ride my bike and skin my knee and stagger around like a drunken sailor even when it hurts because I know how important it is to continue to use them. For most of us, maybe you're familiar with a similar thing. Uh, not many people I know have uh, MS. I know there's a handful of us here uh, in, in the church family. But we're all probably familiar with the phenomenon known as atrophy, right? Atrophy is the loss of use of a muscle or organ uh, of the body through non-use. So if I were to take my arm and like bind it to my side and just wrap it around with a, like a leather belt, pin it to my side and keep it there for a long period of time, the muscles in that arm would atrophy. And I, eventually I would lose the use of that arm because I wasn't using it anymore. They say that if you were in total darkness for long enough, uh, where no light could stimulate the nerves uh, in your eyes, that eventually you'd become blind. If you refuse to allow a part of your body to function in the way it's intended, then you'll lose that, you, that use of the body. You'll lose the capacity for it to function if you don't use it. So let's transfer that fact to a spiritual perspective. If you refuse to yield your heart to Jesus Christ a sufficient number of times, eventually what's going to happen is you'll lose the capacity to do so. You'll be just like the Pharisees who went from would not believe to could not believe. So how do we avoid this? How do we avoid hardening our hearts? How do we avoid this blasphemy, the unforgivable sin? Well, the first thing is to avoid the hardness of a heart. Listen to God's voice. Read your Bible. The things of this world can be very appealing, and it's really easy to sit around and criticize uh, the, the things that were taught uh, from God and revealed to us and that we don't agree with or we think they're outdated, kind of like the Pharisees would do, make up their own rules. Instead, we should lurk, work to learn from God. We should worship together. I know over the corona months, uh, I, I enjoyed certain things about church at home. I enjoyed seeing my family on Sunday mornings. Uh, I enjoyed watching the service from the couch most of the time. But man, I miss the power of when we would come together and the voices and, 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 and the intensity of worshiping God and drawing close to God, but also drawing close to one another during that time. We can serve his children. Listen to God's voice by serving his children. I love having the opportunity to serve kiddos here, to see the classes and the kids buzzing with excitement, to see the teachers beaming with purpose and exhaustion, yes, but purpose. How can you avoid a hardening of a heart? Create margin in your life. Not just, uh, you know, if, if I was the devil, I, I wouldn't just try to like, outright get people to defy God. I would try to distract them. Uh, I, I would try to distract them and make them as busy as possible with things that they think are just so important that it makes it almost impossible for them to catch their breath and experience the presence of God. Create margin in your, in your life. Create margin by saying no to busyness so you can say yes to God. Take time to be alone and pray. Take time to ask God to help you to refocus your, your priorities. If your family is so busy with six ball tournaments, five Zoom meetings, four sleepovers, three play dates, two appointments, and a partridge in a pear tree, you're too busy and you don't have margin in your life. The devil may just be working at you by making you so busy that he can harden your heart where you don't even realize that God is calling out to you. 
third thing here this morning, and this list could go on and on, but I kind of limit it to three. Third thing to avoid hardening your heart is to expose your life to things that move you. Expose your life to things that move the heart of God. Right? I think about the missions opportunities we have just in this community between our own food pantry, chomp, starting point, scheduling of a mission trip, maybe instead of a vacation. Uh, I think about exposing our lives to people around us who are hurting, having a conversation with people. We have so many people who are going through so much. You know, from a metaphysical standpoint, every action or decision makes a connection in our brain, right? And so like this off-repeated action uh, almost creates uh, like an automatic response. Like for me, uh, when I get in my car, uh, my gear shifter is right here in the middle. And so if I go to get in, some, in, in, in my van, it's right here in the middle. And in Jill's van, it's in the middle. So my car's in the middle. Jill's van, it's in the middle. If I go to get in somebody's car and they have the one up here, I will spin, I'll get in, I'll buckle, I'll even see it, and I'll go and I'll reach for that numerous times before I realize, oh, it's up here. Uh, or I think about my grandma, Beatty. Uh, she used to love to cross it, and she'd make these beautiful things, um, and she could seemingly do that while not even paying attention to what she was doing. She could carry on a conversation, we'd watch TV together, uh, and, and you could just see her doing it. It's almost like she could do it with her eyes closed. The first time, maybe, that you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and you felt that tug on your heart, there was this real battle going on in your mind. And maybe for you, some reason you decided Jesus wasn't for you. And so you said no. And so the next time when you were asked to accept Jesus or you exposed to what Jesus is offering you, it was probably a little easier to say no because you had already done it once. You had already established that pattern. Maybe for you now you've said no so many times that it's almost an automatic response. So when someone asks you to believe in Jesus now, your whole body just kind of rises in rebellion without even a thought. You have, become vehement, you have become just like overwhelmingly opposed to it and you don't even know. If that describes you and God has been revealing himself and revealing himself and revealing himself and it's just getting easier and easier and easier to say no, you are close. You are close to having committed the unforgivable sin. You are close to where the Pharisees were when they declared when John declared, therefore, they could not believe. I want to challenge you. Listen to the Spirit. Listen to the Spirit working in your life. Maybe you've suppressed it so far down, but it's probably still there. The fact that maybe you're listening to this shows, at least on some level, it's still there. If it's still there, hey, reach out. Message the church. Contact us. Let's get that next step. Let's say yes to Christ. Say yes to his promises. Say yes to what he's giving us.
Chao.